Good evening, and welcome to the Present Leads to the Future, brought to you by the Hemophilia Federation of America's Families Program. My name is Sandra Wills. I'm HFA's Communications Manager. Also on the line tonight is Carrie Coyne, our Families Program Coordinator at HFA, and our speaker, Dr. Bobby Tran of Emory University. Just a few helpful hints before we get started tonight. We have allotted approximately one hour for the webinar. We certainly welcome your participation and we'll be requesting participation and engagement from you. However, your audio will be muted for the duration of our webinar and as it helps to eliminate background noise. We do encourage you to participate by asking questions and utilizing the chat tool on the bottom right of your control panel. We will then pass your questions on to our speaker. We will be answering all questions at the end of our presentation. We would like to take a moment to thank Genentech, Novo Nordisk, Bayer, Acredo, CVS Specialty Pharmacy, and the CDC Collaborative Partners for funding for our families program. Without their generous donations, this webinar would not be possible. We also want to remind everyone tonight that this webinar is for educational purposes only and is not intended to be construed as medical advice or the official opinion or position of HFA, its staff, its board of directors. Attendees are strongly encouraged to discuss their own medical treatment with their healthcare providers. Again, tonight's presentation is called The Present Leads to the Future. Our speaker is Dr. Duck Tron. Bobby is a uh, doctor at an assistant professor at the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at the Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Tron received his medical degree from the University of South Carolina in Columbia. He completed a residency in internal medicine at the University of South Florida in Tampa, where he also served as chief resident. He then completed a fellowship in hematology at Emory University, where he currently practices and conducts research to improve the care for adults with bleeding disorders. And just before we start, um, we'll, we'll mention that, that Dr. Tron is in Atlanta, who is currently having a, a bit of a thunderstorm. So he may have some background noise, um, but we're hoping for the best and that we won't have any technology issues. And we're looking forward to a great presentation. So Bobby, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sanja. I would like to first start off by thanking HFA for inviting me to talk on this. Uh, here are my disclosures for anyone's review. And before we get started, uh, we'd like to just ask some polling questions. So sure, we'll go ahead and get those started. Um, and audience, if you will just take a second to submit your answers. But at your last comprehensive visit, did you talk to your provider about getting tested for an inhibitor? We'll give that just a second or two more. See what our results are. Um, no, actually, wow, 100% of our audience uh, is saying no, they were not asked about being tested for an inhibitor. So we'll get your slides back up here. Okay, should be good to go now. All right. So this is a outline of what I'll be talking about today. So first, I'll just start with uh, what is an inhibitor? And an inhibitor, first of all, is an antibody that's produced by the immune system. And some antibodies are protective, whereas others are actually working against the body. And in terms of hemophilia patients, patients who develop an inhibitor have something that actually works against the endogenous or the natural factor eight or factor nine that's around, or the factor eight or factor nine that's actually infused, and it stops the factor from effectively stopping a bleed. So clinical signs of an inhibitor 
include when bleeds require increased doses or increased frequency in the infusions of factor replacement, or when bleeds actually don't respond to factor replacement at all. Routine screens uh, are typically done at hemophilia treatment centers, but sometimes in hematology clinics at non-HCC locations, this may not happen. And routine screening is important because some patients may not actually have any clinical symptoms at all, and this may be a laboratory-only finding before it becomes a clinical issue. And actually, a study from the CDC showed that about 60% of patients do not have any clinical signs prior to having laboratory diagnosis of an inhibitor. So the current treatment for hemophilia patients with inhibitors will be discussed over the next few slides. The treatment for patients with hemophilia with an inhibitor can be challenging. And in persons with a low Bethesda titer, therapies can either include factor eight or factor nine replacement products uh, or any of the bypassing agents. However, when there's a large amount of antibodies in the system, um, and this, in this case, these are patients with a high Bethesda titer, uh, we can't actually use the factor eight or factor nine replacement. And the options that we're currently left with are something called prothrombin complex concentrate, or PCCs, activated prothrombin complex concentrate, also known as APCCs, and recombinant factor seven. And these, the two that we're primarily aware of and primarily use are the APCCs FIBA, uh, which is on the left-hand side there, or the recombinant activated factor seven, which is the Novo seven on the right-hand side. And both of these have been demonstrated to be effective in the treatment of bleeding for patients with inhibitors. And um, the APCCs or the FIBA has actually been around since the 1970s and the Novo seven was first FDA approved in 1999. And treatment of inhibitors is actually twofold. Uh, one is to treat the bleeding, and two is to eradicate or get rid of the inhibitor. For this talk, I'll actually be focusing on upcoming or in, currently in trial drugs that are used to treat bleeds in patients. I will not be going into how to eradicate inhibitors or medications uh, for this during this talk. Another product that you might have heard about uh, recently in the news is something called recombinant porcine factor eight. Uh, the brand name is called Obazer, and this was actually recently FDA approved for acquired hemophilia patients with inhibitor. And so this is a little bit different from the patients that have congenital. So the acquired patients actually develop this later on in their life. And typically, this occurs in older patients, usually after 50 or 60 years of age. And so the, this medication is specifically approved only for acquired hemophilia patients with inhibitors. Um, and currently, there's insufficient data for off-label use with patients uh, with congenital hemophilia with inhibitors. So let's move on to what is on the horizon as far as future treatments of patients with inhibitors. So the activated factor seven works like, so here we have a uh, coagulation cascade slide, and this is a very simplified look at how this works in your body. You can see that there are two pathways that ultimately ultimately lead to the combination of factor 10A and 5A in the center here to promote the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and to ultimately form a clot. 
In hemophilia, you're either missing factor eight or factor nine, and therefore it's stopping the intrinsic pathway from working properly. And it doesn't allow for activating factor 10. To the right, you see the extrinsic pathway, and you can see how scientists actually use activated seven, factor seven, to make up for this and allow the clotting cascade to continue. And this is where Novo 7 works right over here. So there are certain com there are companies that are currently carrying out trials to bring other activated factor seven products to the market. So I've discussed Novo 7, which is currently out and being used, but a company out of France called LFB is also looking to bring another conventional factor, activated factor seven product out. And in one trial, LFB is currently testing two different doses to see what is more efficacious in children less than 12 years old with an inhibitor. Additionally, they have a different trial enrolling to test this medication for the prevention of excessive bleeding in congenital hemophilia patients with inhibitors uh, who are undergoing elective surgery. And these, this study is actually open to uh, patients who are six months and older or less than 75 years of age, but they too must also have an inhibitor. There's other companies that are currently carrying out trials to bring out longer acting activated factor seven products to the market. And here we have an alphabetical order, uh, several different companies that are currently enrolling or will be enrolling soon. Uh, there's one company called BioVeritiv, uh, which is a branch of Biogen, who's also testing out a longer acting factor seven product, uh, which uses polypeptide fusion, but these are still currently in research and development. And so that's why I did not list this on here. So now I'm gonna move on to alternative coagulation pro products. The first product that I'll be talking about is a factor 8A mimetic bispecific antibody. And this is also known to some people as emesuzumab or ACE910. And the concept behind this is that ACE910 acts very similar to what factor eight is supposed to do in the body. And it ultimately, so this right up here is what naturally happens. Factor 8A brings together factor 9A and factor 10 to produce this, and then it keeps going down the cascade. So because in patients with hemophilia A, they're missing this factor eight. This bispecific antibody acts to do the same job and it promotes factor 10 activation and accelerates coagulation. So, so far, the, there's been no evidence of potential uh, for inducing factor eight inhibitors and this medication is also administered subcutaneously weekly or monthly, and it can potentially work for patients with hemophilia A with or without an inhibitor. As of December 2016, uh, the study results that have become available showed that Roche did meet their primary endpoint um, in the phase three Haven one study, and it did significantly statistically significantly reduce uh, the number of bleeds uh, when you're comparing them to patients on emesuzumab prophylaxis versus no prophylaxis. It also uh, showed that there was significant reduction in the number of bleeds over time with emesuzumab. Other uh, study results that have been reported uh, include four serious adverse events. Um, there's been the most common adverse events 
uh, were injection site reactions, um, which were consistent with prior studies, but the four more serious reactions uh, included two patients who developed thromboembolic events, or also blood clot, also known as blood clots, and um, two developed something called thrombotic microangiopathy, or preferred to also shorten as uh, TMA. And TMA results in thrombosis in the capillaries or the smallest vessels uh, in your body due to endothelial injury. And this can be seen in association with low platelets, uh, low red cells or anemia, also purpura, which is um, skin discoloration or bruising, and also kidney failure. The uh, common aspect between all the cases of the thromboembolic events and TMAs is that this actually occurred in patients who were on emesuzumab prophylaxis um, and they used the activated prothrombin complex uh, FIBA to treat breakthrough bleeds. And so moving forward, um, Roche has recommended that those on ACE 910 and with an inhibitor to use recombinant factor 7A in order to use or in order to treat any breakthrough bleeds. Um, and one other result that uh, has been reported over the last few months is that there was one patient who actually uh, died who was enrolled in the study. Uh, and for this, the Roche did reveal that the patient had uh, severe rectal bleeding uh, that was subsequently complicated by TMAs, uh, but after the doctors discontinued the um, patient's FIBA, the lab values actually started to improve, but because the uh, patient was still having the rectal bleeding and declined blood transfusion, that ultimately the trial investigator at that site determined that the cause of death was due to the rectal bleeding and uh, not emesuzumab. And I've included down below uh, a website for you guys to go to to see if you guys are interested in any of the studies that I'm talking about to go to to see what the latest enrolling um, enrollment process is for each of the trials. So, the next one uh, that I'll be talking about is silencing antithrombin. And antithrombin regulates the clotting cascade, and when it's low, it can actually lead to blood clots in patients without a bleeding disorder. But evidence that some hemophiliacs with low antithrombin have less bleeding compared to hemophiliacs with normal antithrombin levels. Um, so one alternative coagulation product that utilizes this idea of lowering antithrombin by quote unquote silencing antithrombin with the goal of promoting sufficient clot generation to restore hemostasis and prevent bleeding. And this drug is called fetuzuran. And so what it does is it uses RNA interference, which is a natural process that the cells use to turn off or silence unwanted or harmful genes if the cell feels threatened or is damaged by invading viruses. And so scientists at Alnylum have figured out how to exploit this by introducing to the body artificially created RNA to silence certain genes. Uh, Fetuzuran is a subcutaneous injection that uh, was given monthly for three doses. And they have some data on patients with inhibitor and also non-inhibitor patients. Uh, overall, this drug was very well tolerated uh, with no serious adverse events or thromboembolic events. And all the uh, adverse events that were reported were either mild or moderate. Um, <clears throat> with the Mean, as far as the mean annual bleed rate goes, in uh, patients with inhibitors, it was reported as zero, and those with uh, that did not have an inhibitor, uh, the annual bleed rate was reported as one. Uh, 
Um, as of the latest update that we have um, from the 10th Annual Congress of the European Association of Hemophilia and Allied Disorders in February of 2017, uh, it actually showed that there was also um, some stability studies that were released that showed that the shelf life for this medication is actually greater than two years at room temperature and has resistance to thermal stress as well. And plans to uh, further conduct other studies with this drug uh, will likely occur later this year uh, based on the projections of the company. So the next group of medications that I'll be talking about is called tissue factor pathway inhibitor antibody. And it's shortened to, I'm going to shorten it to um, use the abbreviation TFPI. And uh, so this is actually a potent inhibitor of the initiation pathway of clot formation. Uh, so after injury, the tissue factor and 7A complex activates factor 9 to factor 9A and factor 10 to factor 10A. And this factor 10A generation is tightly regulated by the TFPI. So TFPI inhibits tissue factor in a two-step mechanism. It binds to the active site of factor 10A, um, thus inhibiting the proteolytic capacity of factor 10A. And then the following step is the inhibition of the catalytic activity of tissue factor and factor 7A here. And so um, what happens is that Novo Nordis has developed a humanized monoclonal antibody against TFPI called um, which with this prevents the TFPI inhibition, resulting in uh, more factor 10A production as well as thrombin generation in vitro. And mouse models have shown that TFPI knocked out, reduced these, mouse, these mice uh, bleeding significantly. And so the results of this study actually demonstrated that it was effective with using escalating doses of either IV or subcutaneous um, injections. And these were actually done in patients with hemophilia, both A and B, as well as healthy subjects to make sure that there was a control. And the results showed that with the TFPI reduced for greater than 30 days, this was seen with the IV injections, but even with subcutaneous injections, the TFPI was reduced for 14 to 20 days. Um, and there was really no serious adverse events, uh, but there was one superficial uh, clot that was reported in a healthy male volunteer. Another company that is currently enrolling uh, a anti-TFPI product is Bayer. And I've included the study drug number here. It's uh, the Bay 1093884. And it's currently being enrolled uh, for patients with hemophilia with and without inhibitors. And uh, depending on which arm you're placed in, uh, you may get the medication either intravenously or subcutaneously. Now, other interventions um, that are currently being explored, but not yet in human clinical trials, will be covered in the next few slides. So one uh, way that the factor can potentially work is that, as I mentioned before, the activated factor 10A is important in, at that center point. And so here it explores this idea and it uses um, this idea to bypass the 
upper parts of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways of the coagulation cascade. And so factor 10A um, would bind to factor 5A resulting in Raman generation in hemophiliac uh, plasma to form a clot. But typically, so there we go. So, um, so from the 2A, then that ultimately forms a clot. This is what naturally happens if you have the factor eight and factor nine. And so without the factor eight or factor nine, uh, patients are missing the factor eight. And so 10A will actually never be made on the platelet surface. And the burst of thrombin will never occur. And so researchers at Catalyst Biosciences and Pfizer are currently exploring if they can still form a clot with the administration of activated 10A. And so they're looking to start here, and, which bypasses the factor eight and factor nine steps. And then the activated 10A will combine with 5A to convert prothrombin to thrombin and then to a clot. In mice models, uh, there is no evidence of excessive activation of coagulation. And if the results continue to be positive, then these studies will ultimately lead to human clinical trials. The next uh, intervention that I'll be talking about that is still being currently explored in the lab, but not made it to human clinical trials yet, is something called transplasmatic lettuce. And um, what this is, is that it actually comes from uh, researchers in Pen the Pennsylvania Dental Medicine, School of Medicine, as well as University of Florida and the University of North Carolina, who have collaborated together to develop a therapy that actually helps to prevent antibodies against the infused clotting factor from developing. So what? So they recently uh, reported their K9 findings in a journal called Molecular Therapy. And what they did was they use a patented plant-based drug production platform to produce human clotting factor nine in lettuce leaves. And then the plant wall, the plant cell wall, uh, actually protects the clotting factor from digestion in the stomach. Uh, while being successfully presented to the body's immune system. And so these dogs were actually fed with uh, freeze-dried lettuce powder and given injections of clotting factor nine. And the four dogs that did not receive the lettuce actually developed significant levels of antibodies against clotting factor nine, whereas uh, three of the four dogs in the experimental group that actually received the lettuce had no detectable levels um, of the antibody against factor nine. So again, this is still very early in um, its evolution, but stay tuned to see what may become of this. Another mechanism that is being currently explored in the laboratory is something called a tolerogenic vaccine. And what this is trying to do is it's trying to reprogram human white blood cells um, to become tolerogenic dendritic cells. And so these would help prevent the activation of other immune cells and in animal models of animals with hemophilia A, there actually has been shown a reduction in the occurrence of inhibitors to factor eight, and uh, that the treatment has been long lasting. But again, this is still in research and development, and it hasn't uh, yet transformed to human clinical trials yet. Another uh, mechanism that they're exploring currently is peptide induction of T regulatory cells. And they're using uh, peptides derived from factor eight that have the potential to treat and prevent inhibitor development um, in these patients. 
And it's a patented discovery platform, so we don't have much information about it, but this is also currently being explored. And then the last uh, type of mechanism that is currently being explored is specific T regulatory cells uh, using CARTs or cell receptors derived from patient clones uh, and single chain chimeric antigen receptors. And this is using specific um, regulatory T cells and recognizing the targeted peptides to help prevent inhibitor development in uh, these animals. Uh, but again, still uh, stay tuned to see what other information we may be able to get from uh, these study sponsors. Um, and the last thing I'll just touch base on real quick is I'll just mention you probably have also heard about hemophilia or gene therapy for hemophilia patients. Um, they have had very good success uh, with hemophilia B patients who have been treated with gene therapy and those with hemophilia A, uh, gene therapy is starting to occur as well and those clinical trials are being carried out currently. Um, but this is still a very new area of research that's emerging and there's still a lot of unknowns. And currently this uh, option is only being explored and studied in patients uh, with hemophilia without an inhibitor. Uh, but if the trials remain positive, then they may start carrying this over to those with inhibitors as well. So, and again, for further information about any of the trials that I actually mentioned in this talk, please go to clinicaltrials.gov uh, you'll see a little search bar there that you can enter in hemophilia and then your specific criteria, whether it's one of the medications that I talked about, or if you're just interested in finding out what is available for, uh, what clinical trials are available for hemophilia patients, then you can scroll through there. And if you click on a particular study and you scroll all the way to the bottom, there are different enrolling sites that you can contact. and see if they're currently accepting um, patients to be enrolled at their site or not. And so in conclusion, uh, treatment in the past and present have been limited for patients with hemophilia and inhibitors. Um, but multiple treatments are in the pipeline for treatment of bleeds in these patients. And with these new patients, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, such as do you still need to get tolerized in order to be able to use factor eight or factor nine? Um, when will some of these medications actually be approved for general use and not necessarily just in clinical trials? Uh, if they do get approved and when do they get approved, uh, how much will it actually cost? Will it be paid for by insurance? Um, and also the last question and probably most importantly is, Will it work for me? And unfortunately, you know, there's there there's no way of predicting the future at this time. Um, but this is definitely an exciting time to be in the field of hemophilia because of so many different options that are arising. And these options definitely give us, um, especially those with uh, affected by inhibitors, hope for the future. And so I thank you for your attention and I will entertain any questions at this time after the polling questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tran. Um, we'll, we'll run a few poll questions here um, so our audience can, can participate. Um, just briefly based on what you've, what you've learned tonight, uh, tell us what an inhibitor is um, based on those ch choices. Just another second for the votes to take place. And then one more poll. 
um, the current treatment for an inhibitor includes. Um, so again, based on our presentation tonight, what do we know that the current treatment options for, uh, for inhibitors are? We'll give our audience a second to vote on that. Should be closing that out any second now. All right. So, um, and we thank you for for taking part in those polls, Carrie. I'm just gonna shout out to you really quick. I don't see the results. Um, rather that I see the results for the yeah. There we go. Um, so that's absolutely right, right, Dr. Tron. That that current treatment for inhibitors include bypassing agents um, and immune tolerance induction therapy. Did you? Dr. Tran, did you want to take just a minute to talk a little bit about immune tolerance and, and ITI, um, just in case any of our audience doesn't know what that entails? Sure, I can uh, briefly explain that. So immune tolerance therapy is uh, typically used and reserved for patients who do have an inhibitor, uh, but have a something called a low titer inhibitor. So the Bethesda titers typically are measured anywhere between undetectable, or um, and it, the undetectable is it varies from site to site, um, but it can go very high. And the number that we typically look at is if it's less than five, then we can look to talking about um, immune tolerance therapy. And if it's greater, then we may uh, not necessarily have that option. But immune tolerance therapy is essentially trying to give high doses of factor eight or factor nine to overwhelm the system and overwhelm the antibody or inhibitor that has developed and essentially try to suppress that in order to start making the factor eight or factor nine um, useful to that particular patient. And again, the immune tolerance therapy is used sometimes in conjunction with the bypassing agents to help control bleeds. But the immune tolerance therapy is specifically used to try to eradicate the inhibitor. All right. Thank you. So we've, we've covered a little bit about bleeding management and in inhibitors and and eradicating inhibitors and of course the future for inhibitors and just want to remind the audience um, if, if they have any questions to use that questions box on your control panel I do have a couple um, for you that have come in so I'll go ahead and, and start reading those off um, Dr. Tron, of, of the patients that you are aware of that are enrolled in um, either the Genentech or the Anylum studies, you know, what, what are you anecdotally hearing that their experiences are so far, that those patients' experiences are? So um, the anecdotally, uh, just from speaking to individuals at different conferences who are on some of these studies, um, the overall uh, take is very positive and has been very positive. Um, obviously, we won't know the true results until they're published from the, um, the actual study sponsors themselves. But overall, I think um, it's been very well tolerated. And if it was not very well tolerated, I'm sure that uh, those adverse side of side effects would also be uh, reported by the study sites as well. But I think that the options that are available now, especially with some of the clinical trial drugs, are offering uh, many promising options to patients that, um, you know, did not think that they would see such options become ever available in their lifetime. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, see some of these patients and um, be, you know, part of 
this ever developing and changing um, landscape of treatment for patients with hemophilia with inhibitors. Awesome. And and I know you mentioned in your um, conclusion slide that, that we don't know when the FDA approval is, but since some of those trials are in phase three, are, are we looking at the next 12, 18, 24 months for potential um, FDA approval on some of those products? Sure. So if uh, all the studies get analyzed and um, they turn out to be very positive, then I would probably estimate some of the drugs that are currently in clinical trials right now may be available as early as in the next 12 months. Um, but Again, keep in mind they may, even though it is, or even though they may be approved by the FDA, they may have specific groups that they're approved for. Um, so take, for example, the Obazur drug that I spoke about, the recombinant porcine factor eight. Uh, that was only FDA approved for acquired hemophilia with inhibitor patients. Um, and so I, I think that we'll have to see, it'll depend on the company, what they apply for FDA approval for. But um, I would say probably, you know, start looking in the next year or so if all the uh, results continue to be positive. Okay. We have another question um, about what is the role of rituximab in treating mild hemophilia with an inhibitor? So the role of rituximab is similar to the um, similar to the role of immune tolerance therapy, where both the immune tolerance therapy as well as the rituximab would be working to help suppress the inhibitor and essentially eradicate it. Um, again, the goal of immune tolerance therapy. And the goal of rituximab is not to necessarily treat the bleeding, um, but just eradicate the inhibitor. Okay. Um, and then I have one more question from the audience. Certainly we have time if, if anyone would uh, like to add any more, but this is the final question I have currently. Um, and what would, what would your advice as, as a provider be to patients who are considering participating in any of these trials? That's a great question. And so the first thing that I will say is that clinical trials cannot um, be carried out without the participation of patients. So first, I thank everyone who participates in clinical trials because there's, we can't get advancements in medicine without their participation. Um, if anyone is interested in participating in any, of the, in any of the trials, I think the first thing is to speak to your hematologist to see what potential options are available for you. And if they're not aware of any, you know, and you wanna be more proactive, do go to that website that I provided, the clinicaltrials.gov. It's not, it's a national um, database of all clinical trials that are being carried out in the United States. So it doesn't necessarily only um, uh, apply to hemophilia patients. It, it can apply to any, any diseases uh, that are out there. But the next thing that I would say is that if you are interested in any clinical trials, that you should look and try to contact one of the study sites because even though you may be interested in it, there may be certain criteria that uh, either allow you to participate in it or um, there may be certain criteria that prevent you from participating in it. And so certain patients may have other coexisting conditions um, that may prevent them from participating, like if uh, some of the studies that are affecting, for example, um, that have known side effects that may affect some of your liver enzymes, uh, you, if you have some type of liver disorder or liver disease, then you may be prohibited from uh, participating in that site 
or in that study. So I would say definitely if you're interested to, um, to, to learn, to be proactive and learn uh, what you can from your hematologist, and then if uh, they're not able to provide you with any answers, then to go to clinicaltrials.gov and then also do some research of your own on there as well as for potential uh, research clinical trials that you may be able to participate in. Thank you, and I'll I'll throw a little plug in there for for HFA too. Um, last year we we did a webinar about how to how to weigh the pros and cons of participating in a in a clinical trial, and that's on HFA's YouTube page or um, on our web page in our resource library. And, and folks are welcome to go back and view that if they want some more information about being a good self advocate and, and knowing how and when to participate in a clinical trial. So, um, well, I I don't see any more questions from our audience, so I just want to um, start concluding tonight's presentation by saying thank you, Dr. Tran, for, for a very insightful presentation, and um, thank thank our audience for the questions. Um, it's a, an exciting time in, in the bleeding disorders community, and particularly, I think, for inhibitor patients, as as there are more options on the table than there ever have been before. Um, so it's, it's an exciting time, a, um, a trying time, um, but we'll, we'll get through it with lots of good education like tonight. Um, just as a reminder to our audience, we will have a, a brief survey after the webinar ends tonight just to give um, a chance for you to give us some feedback about, about tonight's presentation and about how we're doing um, here at HFA. And I will just finally mention that we have recorded this webinar um, and it will be available on HFA's social media outlets um, and website within the next few days. So if you need to go back and re-listen and, and catch um, catch any anything that you may have missed, that, that would be great. Um, so again, thank you to Dr. Trum, thank you to Carrie for her technical help tonight. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon um, at, at an event. Thank you very much. Good night.